Welcome to everyone joining us for this webinar, Everything You Wanted to Know About Israeli Apartheid But Were Too Afraid to Ask. My name is Josh Rubner. I am the Director of Government Relations with the Institute for Middle East Understanding. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are recording this webinar for those people who are unable to uh, attend live. And I also just wanted to note that everyone has uh, complete anonymity. They shouldn't be able to see who else is participating in today's webinar. And also, if you would like to ask questions of the panelists, you can write in your questions and you can also choose the Ask Anonymously button. That way, even the panelists won't see your name if you wanna keep that private, but we won't be using uh, the names of any participants. So feel free, even though we're recording this, you know, that you have complete anonymity in this, in this webinar. So with that, let me introduce our three really fantastic speakers to help us really address the issue of Israeli apartheid. As we all know, recently Amnesty International released a report about Israeli apartheid and found that Israel is practicing the crime of apartheid, joining a growing international consensus among human rights organizations, joining what Palestinian analysts and organizations have been saying for decades, really, and what have been joined in recent years by US human rights organizations, international NGOs, and even Israeli NGOs as well. So we're really seeing that there's this growing consensus among the human rights community in the applicability of the apartheid framework. So here to discuss this issue more with us today, we have three amazing analysts. I will introduce them in the order in which they will speak, and then they'll each have about 10 minutes to present their remarks, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. So I'll introduce them in the order they're speaking. First, we have Ines Abdelrazak. She is the advocacy director for the Palestine Institute for Public Diplomacy in Jerusalem, uh, an independent Palestinian organization. And she's also a policy member of Ashebika, the Palestinian Policy Network. Next, after Ines, we'll hear from Omar Shakir, the Israel and Palestine director at Human Rights Watch, where he, uh, which investigates human rights abuses in Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. Prior to his current role, he was a Bertha Fellow at the Center for Constitutional Rights, where he focused on U.S. counterterror policies, including legally representing Guantanamo detainees. As the 2013-2014 uh, Arthur R. and Barbara D. Finberg Fellow at Human Rights Watch, he investigated human rights violations in Egypt, including the Rabah massacre, one of the largest killings of protesters in a single day. As a former Fulbright scholar in Syria, Omar holds a JD from Stanford, where he co-authored a report on civilian consequences of UN drone strikes in Pakistan. Uh, he has an MA in Arab Studies from Georgetown University School of Foreign Affairs and a BA in International Relations from Stanford and speaks English and Arabic. Finally, our third speaker will be Shawan Jabrin. He is a Palestinian human rights defender, general director of the Palestinian human rights organization Al Haq, which is, I believe, the oldest Palestinian human rights organization. Uh, he is also a member of Human Rights Watch Middle East Advisory Board. He was Amnesty International's very first Palestinian prisoner of conscience, and he has worked for years promoting human rights in the face of Israeli occupation of Palestinian occupied Palestinian territories. Al Haq was established in 1979 and has special consultative status with the UN and works to protect and promote human rights and the rule of law in the occupied Palestinian territories. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ines to start the discussion. Thank you, Josh, and thank you very much uh, to you and to the IMU for, for this opportunity. I'm, I'm happy to be with you uh, this evening or this morning for you. Um, so I will, I think, try and highlight a few points. Uh, you know, I, I won't go into kind of what is apartheid in terms of uh, legality. I think that um, my other colleagues will do it. Um, but I wanted to start by saying, you know, here we are again. Um, I think as Palestinians, 
Um, I'm doing this quite often, trying to explain our reality um, in an analytical uh, uh, way, contextualizing, I think, uh, the, I think the, the brutal violence in reality that we live in, trying not to be seen as either biased or too emotional. And I think we have to acknowledge that, that this is, this is also what apartheid is doing, that we are compelled in, in being always put into this position into trying to explain our humanity and our reality uh, so that we are taken seriously. Um, I think the Amnesty you know, report uh, for that, and the, I think the fact that Amnesty has, has released that analysis of 280 pages is a significant uh, uh, moment and step forward. Um, they follow indeed a lot of the Palestinian organizations, Palestinian analysts and experts that have been uh, analyzing and saying that for a long time. And we also have to acknowledge that a lot of uh, these people have you know, been on the front line being fired, uh, being harassed, uh, being uh, smeared uh, because of you know, their, uh, I would say, uh, unfortunately, less, um, you know, less visibility. And again, I think having um, you know, the, more the ability to be attacked rather than, than Amnesty International. And even an organization like Amnesty International, as we can see, uh, was deliberately attacked and framed even before uh, the uh, report uh, was launched. So I think it's a, it's a significant step. And I wanted to highlight, I think, um, important points around why, um, you know, calling our reality, uh, reality of apartheid is important, um, and also why it's also not enough. Um, I think, um, you know, here, um, why the apartheid framework and, 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 and recognizing the reality as one of apartheid allows us to really go forward in deconstructing uh, framings and ways of analyzing our reality that have been too, uh, I think, um, um, pregnant and, and, and kind of uh, positioned for so many decades that they have entrenched the political discourse, the policy approach, and the political approach to what is going on in, in Palestine and Israel. So I think recognizing that there is an apartheid reality uh, and so that there is, you know, this, uh, I think, this systematic uh, domination of one people over another, uh, that there is a regime, a systematic regime uh, to maintain domination of the Jewish people over the Palestinian people, um, is one step into deconstructing, I think, uh, the idea that this is a conflict between two equal sides. And I think that's, that's a very important um, point because this rhetoric that this would be you know, just uh, two, uh, two parties, the Israelis on the one side and the Palestinians on the other that would be dis disagreeing with each other and would, you know, would just have to go around the table to agree, I think is very harmful to, uh, to actually uh, bringing about justice and peace, which is what we all want, is how can we, uh, I think, fulfill the, the fundamental collective rights uh, and individual rights of the Palestinians and, and Israelis. And I think um, apartheid help us understand um, that this is just not uh, this, this uh, you know, that is just not both sides or two sides that are just fighting equally, um, um, you know, or, or a difference in narrative of, of have a difference of opinion. Uh, so apartheid is not an opinion, it's actually, you know, a reality. And I think, again, my colleagues will go more into the, the legality of things. I think the second very important thing to understand uh, with apartheid is that this is, uh, it's not only about the absence of equality, it's not only the uh, kind of, of reality, the current reality of absence of civil rights or unequal rights, but it's also the, um, you know, the... Uh, this um, the system uh, to uh, aimed at maintaining and ensuring the, the that the domination persists, and I think that's very important because we often forget. We take it as this is a package, and tomorrow, if we you know go towards uh, civil and political rights for Palestinians or everyone has equal rights, then everything will be okay. No, it it will not. Uh, why? Because again, since I think since 1948 and even before with 
the Zionist movement and the establishment of the state of Israel, uh, there was deliberately uh, policies and, 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 and laws and, and practices put in place to maintain uh, the domination uh, of the Jewish people over the Palestinian people. And, and with that, I think the, the, um, the intention to, to continue that domination and to also uh, continue the, uh, the oppression that exists today. So I think that's very important to understand because I think it, it goes into the limitation also that I, of, the, of the apartheid framework uh, compared to what I will then um, you know, explain about the settler colonial framework. And one, you know, I think one thing that I also wanted to underline is that obviously you, know, you are all in the United States and I think it can be um, seen as remote and the conversations revolve around whether Apartheid is a okay label or not a label. It's a, it's a reality for millions of Palestinians. And what does that mean concretely for Palestinians beyond this, you know, beyond this word? I think one is, is clear and it's, you know, you can read the analysis uh, of obviously the case studies and everything in the amnesty report is there is the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians and, and the forced expulsion. So massively in 1948 and 67, but also today in a slow but steady manner in, in Jerusalem, you know, Shasharah and Silwan, the Jordan Valley, the Negev Desert, all of this because we're seen as a demographic threat. Same applies to confining us to these Bantustans, you know, these little zones. Um, you know, when we go to a city or another, we're surrounded by checkpoints, military checkpoints. You, you need a permit uh, delivered by the Israelis to move. Uh, Israelis control birth. Um, birth and all the population registries, etc. Um, it means young people are denied the right to love who they want because uh, Israel doesn't, you know, allow uh, Palestinians to marry Palestinians who live on the other side of the Green Line and live them and live with them there. Uh, it means, um, you know, arbitrary arrest and 67% of Palestinian males going to prison and. Uh, or going through arbitrary detention. And that means all of our friends, families, connections, all have people who have been in prison. And so I think that's very important to understand. And I think Agnes Calamar said it during her press conference when launching the report, she said, it's not, it's not the, 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 the act of violence, you know, that's shocking. It's, she, has, she said she had seen violence before, but it's, it's the cruelty of that system, the, this sheer banality, this, uh, and, and, and she said at time absurdity. And I think this is what we need to, to really uh, understand. And so I think, you know, allowing us to deconstruct this idea that this would just be uh, a conflict between two sides. I think such system also has entrenched, uh, I think, uh, you know, in decades kind of our dehumanization and, and the normalization, I think that we are kind of less worthy of rights. Um, and I think also with persisting myths and, and, and allows us to deconstruct those myths like Israel is a democracy. No, Israel is, a, is an ethnocracy. It's a democracy for Jewish people, but it's discriminatory and has a lot of policies and practices, again, described uh, in that report against non-Jewish people. Uh, that, uh, you know, the Israelis, and it also has entrenched things like the Israelis have made the desert bloom. So today, you know, we, we have policies and, and, and again, Israeli rhetoric in place that they're giving us permits and they are uh, developing this and that for uh, the Arab population or the Palestinian population, when actually what we want is our agency and our ability to be deciding for ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think here it's very important to just finally to say apartheid is an important framing, but it's not enough. I think the, um, the report kind of helps understand because of how apartheid emerged from the creation of the state of Israel until today. And the fact that this is also partly, um, uh, you know, um, I think implemented in a way to maintain that domination, uh, it's, it's very clearly has a, a settler colonial, um, you know, complement, complementary approach to it. It has to be understood in that way, because as I said, if we just decide that tomorrow we want just equal rights, this will not do it because uh, Israel is deliberately annexing land, dispossessing Palestinians from land, natural resources, uh, fragmenting our people, 
uh, and all of these are the backbone of that of that apartheid system and has stripped Palestinians from again that agency and is slowly crushing generations you know slowly um, one after the other so there will need to be a lot of uh, you know we need obviously equal rights and I think we need to look at people's rights but we also need to look at reparations uh, and all of what needs to be done to decolonize, I think, that um, the reality. And um, I, I think I'll stop there. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to the question and answers. Thank you so much, Ines, for those really brilliant framing remarks and on the importance and the limitations of the apartheid framework. Very, very insightful. Uh, let me turn it over to Omar. Thank you, first of all, to, to Josh and to IMEU for organizing this and to thank all of you for taking the time to join. So what I thought I would do in my sort of brief remarks is just to sort of start with the word apartheid. So probably for many of you, when you hear the term, it conjures up images of events in Southern Africa. Um, you know, historically, folks have used the term as a sort of comparative historic or simply a pejorative term. And you certainly saw some of the reactions uh, to the human rights reporting on, on the situation on the ground revert to that terminology. But actually apartheid is a legal term. The world decided um, amid the events of South Africa, uh, you know, from 1948 until 1994, that these events were so heinous that they wanted to actually create a prohibition on these sorts of activities taking place. So actually there is a, the universal prohibition under international law against severe discriminatory oppression is known as apartheid. It has the status of customary international law, meaning that the prohibition against apartheid has the force of law everywhere in the world. In addition, important international legal instruments define apartheid as a crime against humanity. For example, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court identifies apartheid as one of 11 crimes against humanity, among many others. As a crime against humanity, apartheid refers to basically three main things. One is an intent by one group of people to dominate another. Second is uh, uh, systematic oppression by the dominant group over the marginalized group. And the third thing is inhumane acts. So again, if you break this down to normal crime, you need an act, inhumane acts, that take place in a context. The context is systematic oppression with a certain intent, an intent to dominate. Um, there's other crimes against humanity that are related. So for example, Human Rights Watch, when we look at discrimination that's severe with oppression, we also look at persecution. Al-Haq and many others have done the same. Persecution is a crime against humanity with a similar definition. Uh, basically, uh, severe deprivations of fundamental rights when combined with uh, a, a, a discriminatory intent. So the reason I provide this background is many people sort of in, in and looking at the use of the terminology, sort of forget the work of human rights groups, uh, whether it's Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, whether it's Palestinian groups that have been doing this work, Israeli groups, our job is to document the facts and apply the law. So when Human Rights Watch set out to write our report, which Josh has linked to in the chat, one year ago, but when we set, we set out to write this several years prior, Amnesty went through a similar process. Al-Haq, other groups who have reached apartheid designations have done the same. What you start by doing is documenting the facts. So we looked at Israel's treatment of Palestinians using the methodology we use in the 100 countries around the world we operate, which meant we interviewed people. Uh, we did case studies. We compared the treatment of Palestinians living next to Jewish Israelis in different areas under Israel's control. Uh, we looked at government statements, we looked at policies, laws, uh, we did dozens of interviews. We then took the facts that we documented and we applied the law against discrimination. Uh, and you know, we looked at Israel's treatment of Palestinians, we reached the conclusion uh, at Human Rights Watch that the Israeli government is committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. Um, Amnesty reached similar conclusions, al Haq. Uh, other Palestinian uh, human rights groups, Israeli groups, and it's not just, you know, the ones that are known like Bet Salem, you now have uh, near a dozen, if not more than a dozen Israeli groups that have also used the term apartheid in relation to Israel's treatment. 
What was our finding based on? Our finding was based on uh, a conclusion we reached based on two years of field research that the Israeli government has pursued an intent or a policy to maintain the domination by Jewish Israelis over Palestinians. And that in addition to that, the Israeli government has committed grave abuses against Palestinians. Um, that's a similar basis that Amnesty International released. So when it comes to that first part of the analysis, the intent or policy, the report documents in meticulous detail. And again, this is a short webinar, so I'm just gonna give a, uh, an, an overview here, um, you know, that the Israeli government has sought primarily to maintain control over demographics and land. So that the, the quest to maintain a Jewish demographic majority has led them, uh, has underlied policy across Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. And the report, our report over 200 pages, you know, recites many examples, not only of laws that are illustrative and policies, but also statements by officials that, that indicate that this is a, a major motivating factor. The other part of it is, of course, control of land, maximizing the land available to Jewish Israelis, confining Palestinians to enclaves, or I think he must use the word bantistans, or sort of smaller, smaller areas and maximizing the land for Jewish Israelis. Again, a policy that permeates everywhere the Israeli government controls from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. In addition, human rights groups have reached this finding of apartheid based on systematic oppression and inhumane acts. Uh, and those are two core elements of the definition, not only under the Rome Statute, to the International Criminal Court, which defines apartheid, but under a separate convention on apartheid. There are many examples. Inas provided examples of several of them. They include, I'm just giving a few examples, but sweeping movement restrictions, right? So 2 million people living in the Gaza Strip in a 25 by 7 mile open air prison, for a policy for nearly 15 years that nobody can leave that area absent narrow humanitarian exemptions. Uh, so again, nobody has the right to, to move. It's not a security-based policy. It's everybody, unless you fit within a narrow exception. In the West Bank, of course, hundreds of military checkpoints, a permit system that means you need a permit to enter even the occupied West Bank, restricted movement between West Bank and Gaza, the separation barrier built largely on Palestinian land. Again, I'm just giving you facts of, of the reality on the ground that the report documents in great depth. You also have the mass expropriation of Palestinian land. Right, more than one third of the West Bank in East Jerusalem, you know, for example, um, that's been taken from Palestinians. And that the Israeli government, 99% of the land redistributed for civilian use has gone to Jewish Israelis living in settlements which violate international humanitarian law. They're a war crime because it constitutes transfer of one civilian population to territory acquired um, you know, by war. Um, and, and, and the policy goes on. You have other inhumane acts, you have home demolitions, coercive policies that make it 100 times based on government data between 2016 and 2018 that the Israeli government, 100 times more uh, demolition orders and building permits for Palestinians living in the majority of the West Bank under Israel's exclusive control, the mass suspension of civil rights for millions of Palestinians, uh, you know, a 50 year old Palestinian who's never had the right to free expression, assembly or association in uh, the occupied territory, and on and on and on, right? And of course, the Israeli government justifies many of these policies by pointing to security. But the reality is many of the abuses at the core of the crime of apartheid actually have no legitimate security justification. Right, policies for the, the denial of building permits, the land expropriation. You know, we could go on and on and on. And of course, Human Rights Watch, our recommendations for what to do based on these abuses are consistent with where we found crimes against humanity elsewhere in China, uh, in, in, in the Rakhine state of, 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 of Myanmar, and many other uh, examples. Let me just sort of conclude, because I know we want to get hear from Shawan and get to question and answer by sort of saying where we are right now. You have a situation where apartheid is now consensus in the global human rights movement, right? And it's not just in the global human rights movement. You have a situation now where within Israel, you have a former attorney general, deputy attorney general, 
you know, prime minister, ambassadors of Israel to South Africa, uh, you know, who have also uh, used the term apartheid in relation to Palestinians. You have Palestinian civil society who's been saying this for decades. You have prominent voices in the international community, including the former UN Secretary General. You have states like South Africa and Namibia, the French foreign minister, that have also used the term apartheid. So what we really see is that more and more folks are recognizing the reality on the ground for what it is. So it's important, I think, in the US Congress to understand some ba basic truths, right? That a 50 plus year occupation is not temporary. That a 30 plus year peace process will not on its own dismantle systematic oppression. And that stripping millions of Palestinians of their fundamental rights solely because of who they are is not simply a matter of uh, going too far on security or an abusive occupation. Apartheid is not some hypothetical future scenario, right? It is the present day reality, as Ina said, for millions of Palestinians. And those who strive for Israeli-Palestinian peace, whatever solution you, must, you may endorse, must start. The starting point to get to anywhere must be recognizing reality for what it is. The wrong diagnosis leads to the wrong conclusion. The reality is apartheid. Inas is right. There are, you know, you need to see apartheid among the larger context, but without being able to understand, recognize, say what reality is, you'll never be able to bring the sorts of basic human rights measures that we bring everywhere in the world when abuses are this grave to the situation. I'll stop there and look forward to hearing uh, your, your questions and from Shawan. Thank you so much, Omar, for that really, really useful legal overview and also all the methodological ways in which Human Rights Watch found that Israel is practicing apartheid. That was very, very helpful. Uh, let me turn it over to Shawan. Thank you, Joshua. And I would like to thank also IMU for organizing this uh, event. Uh, <clears throat> You know, I don't think that uh, the apartheid started when we discovered it or when we uh, spoke about it. That's the case. When we spoke about it, this is just recently, you know, it's not just decades long time ago or since 48. Uh, when it goes back to the root of that, I think we can't ignore what's happened in 48 and even before as a route uh, there. Another thing is we ourselves as Al-Haq, for instance, when we studied it uh, genuinely, let me say, and thoroughly first, it was in uh, 2007 and eight, mainly after you know the former uh, special repertoire to the Palestinian occupied territory, John Dogert, he submitted his last report uh, to uh, Human Rights Council at that time. And at that time, uh, we said, you know, it's good, you know, to study what his report included at that time, the final things. He said that this occupation, because his mandate covered only 67 area. And uh, he said that the, there are an elements of colonialism and apartheid in this occupation nature. That's the issue. And Virginia Taylor at that time, when she came to Al-Haq first, and she said, we would like you know, to study this, what's mentioned in his report. I told her one main thing. I told her I will study it in the frame of occupation and 67 area to see if there is something like that or not, to start using even the term, the term. And as al haq at that time, we were, we took the responsibility to study that part re relating to apartheid, academically speaking, and jointly with Adala, also uh, organization. And it was the biggest part of the report, the report around 300 pages, but the part of uh, apartheid, it was 150 pages. And it's like a very uh, academic uh, one, and it's not just theoretical one. We build it on what's going on in the ground, practices, policies, all of these things. We analyze the reality, 
that's the case because of that when we speak about apartheid it's not just a theoretical things that we are speaking about and it's not just an intellectual exercise and discussion no because palestinians they are living in this situation you call it apartheid you call it something else for the academics for them it's not big things the main big things is the, even the reality and the life that they are living, the fragmentation from one side, even the intention, you know, to fragment them as part of a policy, long term policy. This is exist and this is what they are living in. The refugees issue, when it, you go back, you find the foundation and the root is there, you know, the uh, settler colonialism thinks that's the colonial settler colonial issue is there. That's the case, I think. When Ines spoke about uh, root cause and when she addressed also the uh, settler colonial issue, this is connected directly and genuinely to the apartheid things. It's not just, you know, apartheid and full stop about this. No, this is, I think, where we uh, go in that. And this is not just some pure academic discussion. No, no, it's not. Because it's not you know, the Palestinian case, it's not, you know, the, just texts here or there, but the text and the terms and the concepts is very important because it opened to you, you know, before you, the, uh, the situation, open your eyes on the what's going on on the ground, why you reach this concept and now using this concept or term. That's the issue I think it's important because of that, for those they are not specialized in uh, legal terms and legal uh, aspects, it's good to open the eyes to go to the reality. Reality saying this, Human Rights Watch, they, you know, address that in the report. It's a thorough report and it's very rich report. Uh, Amnesty International also, it's a rich report about that. Uh, and those organizations, when they conclude the same thing that we have been addressing since also so, so long, I think it's important. It's important just to open the eyes. You can't close your eyes from what's going on. Another thing is when also the uh, UN committee, you know, third, you know, UN committee uh, against racial discrimination, when they came in 2019, mainly in uh, November and December, in 4th of December at that time, in their conclusion that Israelis, they violate even the article two and three of the convention, and they spoke, and this is the first time ever that UN uh, body, uh, treaty body, uh, addressed the issue of discrimination and racial discrimination, which it's lead to, you know, uh, apartheid. This is the first time you can't say that they are biased, for instance, or let me say they use it politically here or there. I think even. President Carter, when in his book, you know, when he addressed apartheid in 2006, this is an issue. This is an issue. We are late, to be honest with you. We delayed a lot to address these things, but to be now to address it uh, and to open the eyes for what's going on, it's better than just to come later on also for the next 10 years or 20 years or 50 years like, like that. Why it's important, I think. It's important, I think, to take actions and to see the root cause and to see where is the main thing absence in this situation. What's exactly absence in this situation? If this is the situation that we are living under it since uh, 48 and until today, what's exactly it has to be taken? What's missing? in this case i think that's the important question if you ask me what's missing in that case i think is the political will to take actions to act according also your uh, legal obligation uh, because there is nothing called peace you know and stable peace without justice that's one of the main thing this is the case and because of that you have to understand exactly also the context of this without addressing the context of this situation and going to the root cause of that, 
it, it will be, you know, you will repeat yourself again and again and again. And what Ines said, you know, that this is, it's not just a conflict between two equal sides here, and they called it an equal uh, case, Israel and Palestinians. No, more than that, if you have no right, for instance, to go back to your property, to your homeland, to enjoy that, and you can't, and you can't do that because there is an official decision uh, from the Israeli side not to allow you to go back to your home. You are just away from your home, your land, 200 meters away or 500 meters away, and the Israelis dealing with, uh, with you as which called, let me say, present absentee. What's this? Where is this? Could you just give me what's the logic behind that? Where does this exist? For instance, in Ali, in Ali, just uh, system, justice system, or in any law over the world, except here, in this case, you are away from your land, 500 meter, and you have no right to go, and it's not your right. They recognize you are uh, uh, present absentee. I don't know what's this present absentee. Pregnancy, for instance, you are pregnant or not pregnant. If you, you are exist or not exist, you are absent and not absent. But what's this present absentee? As you want, just you design things for me, not to allow me, for instance, to use my land and to enjoy my property. This is something, maybe some people, they don't know about some detail, how Palestinians living in their daily life. Things like that, I think, is a very, very important for everything that we address when it comes to politics, when it comes to economics, when it comes. Another thing, or the last point I would like to address is the self-determination things. Without connecting this with the Palestinian self-determination as a fundamental right and as a Jewish Kogan's issue, you know, that's, I think, we miss something. And here, when I say, self-determination to the Palestinian people. This is connected also to the root cause. This is connected to all of these things. This is connected also to the framework. Which framework you are speaking about? And do we, do we speak just about the Palestinians they are living now in West Bank and Gaza, including in Jerusalem? Or we are speaking about Palestinian peoples? And who is the Palestinian people? I think this is, I think, very, very important issue. This is where it bring the issue of refugees. This is where it bring the issue of 48, this is will bring, you know, the issue of what we are living now. And here, you know, the last point is also equality, equality, what it means, equality just on papers or equality in reality, and you enjoy really the reality. Things. This is, you know, what I tried to, I'm sure that many people, they have many questions in their minds about this issue. And again, it's not just a theoretical and it's not just an intellectual discussion. No, we are discussing people, they are suffering under these situations. We are discussing people's life. We are discussing a future. We are discussing, you know, justice. We are discussing peace. We are discussing, when we discuss these things, we are discussing everything. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joanne, for that really important historical overview of uh, apartheid and how we are late to the, to the game in terms of getting to the root causes of, of addressing this issue. Uh, just to give a little bit of background to the very Orwellian term that Shawan introduced, present absentees. These are Palestinian citizens of Israel who were pushed off their land in 1948 and who are unable to return to their homes and their properties within Israel, even though they are Israeli citizens, supposedly with the rights of citizenship. Uh, so with that, I want to really thank all of our three speakers for these really important opening remarks. And I do want to open it up to our participants to address questions. You can chat them in. You can use the uh, question function uh, on Zoom to address your questions to the panelists, and I will ask them of the panelists. And in the meantime, since we do have a congressional audience here today, can, can each of you address what are the, the political and legal implications for US policy toward Israel and toward the Palestinian people as a result of this apartheid designation? Who would like to start? I can try and start. 
Thank you, Josh. And um, I think it's an important question that I, I thought you know, I, I didn't address because indeed you are all working either with uh, Congress people or around. Uh, um, and so I, I, I think the question is, OK, once once we have the diagnostic, because that's what it is, I think the uh, importance of you know recognizing that there is apartheid is is doing the right diagnostic. If you have the wrong diagnostic, you have the wrong healing. And I think that's what we're having now is Unfortunately, again, by, by seeing this uh, in the wrong lens, um, we, are, we are applying the wrong answers. And so I think what's very important is once we recognize this diagnostic of apartheid, what are the policy response to it? And, and you know, Shawan and, and Omar hinted to it is there needs to be accountability. Uh, it's not about trying, again, to bring about Palestinians and Israelis around the table. When there is injustice, when there is inequality, systemic discrimination and oppression, you are looking at the accountability of those who are oppressing. And I think a very big reality today is that, unfortunately, the U.S. and the U.S. taxpayer is complicit into apartheid. And I would say that the wrong answers that are being given today are things like the Normalization Act and trying to promote further normalization uh, of Israel with, with other um, uh, countries and, and you know, extending the Abraham Accords. We cannot detach the Israeli uh, state regime, Israel's policies overall from uh, the apartheid that is, uh, you know, that the apart it's apartheid regime. It is in Israel. It's between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea that this reality is. You cannot decouple Israel and then suddenly uh, what they would do to Palestinians. This is entrenched. And so promoting the Normalization Act is definitely the wrong response. Same with the two-state, uh, you know, the two-state uh, solution act. This is also the wrong response because it's not holding Israel accountable. It's trying to put it to sugarcoat uh, the reality and trying to apply the wrong answers. Accountability and ending the military aid to Israel is what is needed. And I think until there is, uh, you know, uh, Israeli allies and friends who are changing that relationship with Israel, Israel will continue uh, with impunity. And you know, with I think this uh, this license to to continue uh, entrenching the, the apartheid reality. Thank you, Ines. Uh, Add Omar. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say. I mean, I would agree with Ines totally. Let me just start from again, like a human rights uh, angle, right? This is the first time we found this human rights watch the Israeli government committing crimes against humanity, right? And they're called crimes against humanity because the world decided that these are crimes against all of us. They're that odious. Um, and they come with it certain sets of obligations. I would just say three top level things, and I'll just say it very briefly. Um, the first is your approach. When there are crimes against humanity, your approach must be to immediately end those abuses. The US approach has put everything behind a 30 year long, at least rhetorically, peace process. There is no peace process, it's a fig leaf. And the problem with the US approach is that the peace process treats human rights abuse as a symptom of the problem. That if you get a peace process, then you'll solve human rights abuse. But that has it exactly wrong. The core problem is not the absence of the peace process, the core problem is structural entrenched repression. That needs to end. To tell a Palestinian born in Gaza that you will, sorry, you can't move freely like every other person in the world. Someone in the West Bank, sorry, you can't have your civil rights. A Palestinian citizen of Israel, sorry, you're born as inferior under the law. A Palestinian refugee in Lebanon, sorry, you can't go back to your country, though a Jewish American can go do so tomorrow. Because you're Palestinian, wait until the peace process happens is not the way you deal with grave human rights abuse. In the U.S., everybody wants to talk about solutions. They talk so much about solutions that you forget the problem that necessitates a solution. So there needs to be a fundamental whole of government reshaping of the U.S. approach to deal with this like you deal with other situations. I've covered Egypt for, you know, I've worked on U.S. human rights abuse. There's a different approach you're supposed to take. So the first point is you need really an entirely different governmental approach. The second point is when you have crimes against humanity, and Yanas said this exactly, you must end complicity with those crimes. 
right? Complicity can take many forms. But in the United States, you have to look at U.S. arms sales to Israel, right? And the reality here is we're talking about crimes against humanity. And so long as abuse of this gravity are taking place, you know, you can't continue with arms sales. It's quite simple, right? It's, it's, it, you cannot be providing military support, arms sales to a government engaged in abuses of this scale when there are no steps being made to address them. And third and finally, and again, you know, I said this, you need accountability, which means you need to support the International Criminal Court and their formal probe. You need to support the commission of inquiry as it looks into not only the events of a year ago, but also their root causes and on and on and on. So these are just the basic steps that are, these are not options. This is what the law says about how you deal with crimes against humanity and, 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 and apartheid, specifically, but more generally crimes against humanity. Change your approach to end human rights abuse and complicity, hold perpetrators to account. Shawan, would you like to add anything? I endorse uh, Omar and Dinas, but uh, one word I would like to say, one point I would like to emphasize. Uh, we gave a chance, for instance, the Palestinians, or part of the Palestinians gave a chance to which called peace process of Oslo. 30 years after that, and the agreement between, at that time, between PLO and Israel, no one word mentioned occupation. It means that even they didn't, they try to fly from a different place, from different space, from different reality, that even there is no occupation. And we see now by our eyes what's going on since that time. Three times more, you know, for more times, you know, uh, land confiscation, three times more settlement expansion, uh, house demolitions of Palestinians, you know, on a daily basis. That's what you see. Is it just something happened randomly and things like an isolated incident here or there? Or if there is just a long-term plan behind all of these things? This is, I think, we have to ask ourselves. I'm a practical person. Pragmatic. Let me be pragmatic 100%. We have to ask ourselves, why this failed? Is it just Palestinians responsible? What's going on on the ground? Could you see it? That's, this is, I think, part of the problem, how they are dealing with the things. Let's ignore everything, and this is start from today. I think we tried this for more than 50 years, and it doesn't work, and it didn't work. How it works, I think, because of that, I think it's a time even to shift completely, even how you look at the things and how you frame things and how you put things in the context. I think what's missing even putting things in the context of things. It's exactly like I steal your house and after that I will try to improve your life. Okay, I will give you from your money, you know, something to go to buy something from a shop. Is this the case that the Palestinians need or beyond this? Their dignity, their fundamental rights, their rights, I think it's important. Can you as an American, if they come to you, for instance, and take your homeland and say, okay, guys, in Texas, there is an oil there. We will take it, everything, blah, 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 blah. And they, you know, they control everything. And just they give you some money here or there for you. Are you ready to live with that? With no rights, for instance, they don't allow you even to move freely. They don't allow you to live even in dignity. And all the time they want you to live in fear. That's more than that, they divide your family. Part of your family, they are in Mexico and the other part in Texas. And they don't want them to be unity, united, you know, the, the unity of the family. This is what's going Palestinians. It's not isolated incidents. No, millions of Palestinians living like this. This is the case. Thank you. Thank you, Shawan. That's a perfect segue to a really important question that someone asked from the audience. And this is something that we've heard from members of Congress who oppose the Amnesty International report and the apartheid designation. So 
if, if each of you would like to address that, this would be uh, really great. So the question is, in what ways is this designation of apartheid actually productive to improving Palestinian lives? Is there any demonstrable history of quote unquote shame, if you will, you know, of actually improving the situation on the ground for Palestinians? And I'd actually ask you also to analogize this to the South African situation, because I'm sure that same question was asked as well in the South African context. How did the apartheid designation actually help improve the lives of Black South Africans? Who would like to start? Please, Joanne. Look, I would like to respond like this to the people they ask this question. Let's drop what the Human Rights Watch said. Let's drop what's Amnesty said. Could you please, could you please establish a committee or a commission from the Congress and the Senates to gather, for instance, to investigate the case in Palestine in a very, in a very a professional way, in a very just way, and all of these things. And they themselves to come, for instance, here and to see how Palestinians they are living. Could you please just study the reality also in the ground? in 48 and 67 and everywhere, that's, and we will agree with your conclusion at the end. But you have to set a commission or a committee to say that this committee to investigate the situation in Palestine. But not to be like, to close eyes and to say, I don't want to hear this or to hear that. Don't hear al haq don't hear a human rights watch. But what's about amnesty? What's about the committee at the UN? All of them, they are biased. It's okay. You are not a biased body. I ask the Congress, establish committee like this. Thank you. I would, I would love to see Congress come out and investigate the situation on the ground for itself. Thanks, Josh. I would just add to what Chawan said, which is a great, a great suggestion, by just saying for Human Rights Watch and human rights groups generally, our starting point is um, we apply the law. So regardless of what our, our you know, designation, what we might think is productive or not productive, our credibility is we document the facts, apply the law, and we reach the conclusion. That's what we did here. We didn't, you know, at the same time, I would make the important point that, as I noted earlier, a huge part of the problem here is there is this fantasy world that the discussion about Israel-Palestine exists in. In the US, if you listen to people talk about Israel-Palestine in the US, it bears little relation to the reality on the ground. There is a need for there to be an, uh, a, you know, a, a paradigm shift, a, re a recognition of the gravity of human rights abuse. And um, because you, you need to recognize that in order to get to the sets of actions that fall from it. The, as I said earlier, the wrong analysis leads to the wrong conclusion. Moreover, apartheid is a legal it's a crime. It's a legal term. There are obligations that stem from it. And I think it's important to note where, I mean, Israel, for example, has committed many war crimes. You know, it commits a war crime every single day with settlements, many war crimes over with the transfer of civilian population in Gaza, right? But when you say crime against humanity as a legal term, you're saying there is a policy in place to commit an intent to commit this grave abuse. So you have to dismantle that system, right, that exists. You have to sort of fundamentally change the laws, policies, and practices that lead to it, right? You can't say, oops, I made a mistake. Oops, I was trying to protect my security. I went too far. No, this chorus of voices is saying at core, the policy is to commit these serious crimes and abuses. I understand the skepticism of, you know, why the focus on the term. One is because it is what reality is. You need to understand that. But two, it's because understanding that reality necessarily leads you to the recommendations for how to move forward. Ines, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, I think sometimes there's also some attention to also some things like that. Let's move to when he came to you, what's that? He says that we don't want more changes made more Ines, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're having trouble with your audio. You may you may want to just shut off your video for a second and speak because it's not coming in clearly. Can you try now? Go, go ahead, try.
Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, you're not you're not coming in clearly. Let me let me come back to you uh, in in a minute, and hopefully your connection's better. Uh, you know, and I'll I'll also just say that the apartheid policies of domination that Israel is implementing over the Palestinians. By design, they're meant to immiserate and impoverish the Palestinian people. So if we talk about improving the daily lives and conditions of the Palestinian people, dismantling the apartheid regime will lead to that improvement. And, you know, economic rights is not a substitution for political rights. Uh, Ines, are you back with us? Can, can you try again? Uh, I think you may be muted now. Yeah, can you hear me? Much better, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I was saying that, you know, yeah, what you were saying basically, you know, Desmond Tutu, when he came to the US in the 80s, he said, we don't want our chains to be made more comfortable, we want our chains removed. And the same, I remember reading recently about Rosa Parks, you know, at some point in the negotiations after she, she refused to get off the bus, uh, there was negotiations of like, okay, how can we maybe make more space for like black only seats instead of giving equality to everyone to sit on the same bus? And I think these are all the wrong solutions. Um, we have to realize that as Omar said, that system needs to be dismantled. And I think until we realize that, um, you know, the Israelis will sell you for, uh, maintaining that status quo and continuing to entrench apartheid, of course, they will want to sell you that they're uh, doing some policies here and there and practical steps, uh, you know, so-called improving Palestinian lives. But what Palestinians want is, is choosing for itself. We don't want a permit to register our child. We actually want to control the population registry for, for our children. And so I think this is, this is what we're missing in the US debate. And I think this, these, needs to be the policy response to that, is how um, every single step that you're taking is, is it contributing to the rights of Palestinian people, people in general? Is this contributing towards self-determination of Palestinians? Not about the solution. Is this, is this somehow pleasing Israel or is this a, a part of the peace process? No, is this contributing towards fulfilling people's rights? Thank you so much, Ines. Uh, so we are just about out of time, but we do have one, one more question that I want to get in. So maybe if each of you could just address this in 30 seconds or so as kind of your closing remarks, um, how can changes, and I would add in what changes in US policy and behavior would best recognize and support Palestinian self-determination? Ines, you wanna start? No, I'll let the others conclude, so go ahead. Uh, just... uh, Omar or Shawan? <laughs> sure, I, I mean, I think I sort of covered this earlier. I'll just say that I think you, you, you need to start with a whole different government approach rooted in human rights. I think you need to condition all military security assistance on steps to end apartheid. Those steps aren't happening, so, that, so the reaction should, should flow from that. Um, I think you need to, um, you know, sort of fundamentally look at all aspects of US policy, every aspect of the relationship is to Israel, see whether or not it's committing, uh, contributing to these crimes against humanity, uh, minimize human rights impacts where you can't end those activities. Um, I think those are some of the big steps I'll take. I have also another suggestion. One of that is just to look for the US to look at its obligation under the international law. I know maybe in the US they don't take that seriously. The first thing is the US law. Even the US law speaking about democracy and about you know, the, uh, the dignity and all of these things. Could you please just stand behind even your principles in dignity and democracy and just to try to translate that on the Palestinians, how they are living? And is this you know, the full dignity, enjoining uh, dignity or not? This is an issue. Another thing is uh, US as a leader, you know, uh, could you please go for instance and uh, see which uh, conventions that you uh, ratified and see how you can implement that 
in a good faith here and there and push for that? Could you please just cooperate with the others, for instance, to translate the obligation under the uh, international law? That's, I think, what's required. I don't want to go, you know, to translate this or that. Just this is part of your obligation as U.S. When it comes to the self-determination thing, I think this is also part of this. But if you ask me, I can say hope also is coming from the U.S., mainly from the young generation, to be honest with you. I do believe about it strongly because I see the change. World is change. World is change. And I think every, everyone has now to think about what's going on here also in Palestine and elsewhere relating to rights, re relating to justice issues. Thank you. Thank you, Shawan. Ines. Thank you. Can you hear me now? I'm just wary yes. of my microphone. Uh, yeah, and last word, I think I would say also look internally and inward uh, to, to American democracy. I think it's super important to center Palestinian voices, and this is heavily under attack. Don't, you know, don't credibilize a Palestinian uh, just when it's next to an Israeli voice or, or try and equate, you know, an Israeli government official uh, to, to a Palestinian when they're uh, telling their reality, including American Palestinians. I think the space is really in danger. And I think criminalization of solidarity and of Palestinian Americans is, is tremendous. And I think this also needs to be addressed. And I think this is part also of the journey of centering the Palestinian experience, those who know the reality and who uh, are the, the first uh, ones to be able to, to explain it. And so not to criminalize them or to criminalize a boycott, et cetera. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ines, and thank you, Omar and Shawan. This was a really, really rich and productive conversation. And thanks to everyone who tuned in live and we'll be sure to send around the link so you can share it with others in your congressional office. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much.